All right, time for a new chapter. So the last chapter that we're going to go over this semester is the expenditure cycle. So this has to do everything with buying stuff and that we would then turn around and sell or assemble or put together, whatever. And this also includes services, of course. So just to define, uh, do we miss one? Nope. Uh, just to define the expenditure cycle. So it's everything associated with purchasing goods and services and paying for them. Makes sense. Obviously paying for them is a critical thing because you won't be able to get more goods and services if you don't pay for uh, what you get. So some things that we want to achieve in the expenditure cycle. So first, maintaining the vendor records, similar to what we did with the customer records, make sure we have accurate information. We wanna be able to track our purchases from the vendor so we know who we're spending our money with. And in fact, that allows us to, um, if we have an overall picture of what we're spending, we may be able to negotiate some discounts or lower prices and things like that. Controlling inventory, much like we did in the um, revenue cycle. We want to know how much we owe each of our vendors or suppliers. And of course, make payments and accurate payments. We don't want to overpay, of course. And then of course you want to forecast your purchases, which relies on your sales forecast. Some of the documents that we use here. Uh, most of these you have seen, uh, we'll talk about a purchase requisition in a minute. Um, a procurement card is basically a credit card bill or receipt. Um, and we'll talk, actually, we're going to skip talking about petty cash because really it's not used anymore. So we'll have a couple slides in a little bit. We'll skip over. Some output things. So one of the things is a approved vendor list. Uh, everything on here, you've, you've seen many of these reports either in your managerial or cost county, a cost accounting class or other courses. Ah, this slide should look familiar. So we still have the same general threats and controls with master data and sensitive information. Or the loss of data and performance. So since we talked about those in chapter eight, uh, we're going to skip ahead and go to the next area. Well, you can review chapter eight if you need to for those slides. So there's actually uh, three basic activities, four in some textbooks if you look. So the first thing is ordering goods. So we, we send out a purchase record order to, uh, to a vendor to try to order goods. We receive those goods or services, and then of course we pay for them. We are gonna go into more detail in each of these, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here on this slide. Sometimes you see um, paying for goods as an approval of the invoices and then paying. Uh, so it's usually sometimes broken out into two steps. Oops. Uh, so actually table one in your textbook. So in if you have the shorter textbook, it'd be labeled table 9-1. In uh, the full textbook, it is uh, table 13-1 basically is lining up the revenue and expenditure cycle side by side. So you can see in the revenue cycle, we have a sales order entry. On the expenditure side, we have ordering of goods. Makes sense. In the revenue cycle, we have shipping, we have receiving on the other side. Billing, processing invoices, cash collections, cash disbursement. So you can see the two lining up you know, so if somebody's selling us, they're collecting cash, we're giving them cash. So it's just uh, an opposite uh, of each other. All right, so the first thing we do is order the goods. So usually uh, we start with a purchase requisition, but this purchase request is triggered by a couple things. So first of all, the inventory control system. We could be down to 30 pieces and that's our reorder point. So that triggers a, the process to reorder more parts for possibly our manufacturing cycle. Uh, various employees. So I could put in a requisition that I want a new whiteboard for my office or a new TV, better yet, right? Um, 
I could put in a requisition describing how big I want it, possibly what brand, uh, and all the items, and unfortunately, who to charge it to. Um, if I don't want to pay for it myself, it needs to go to a department within the university. And then back orders from the revenue cycle. So if we have a back order from a sale, that would also trigger a purchase. Or as I said, a manufacturing request. So we start with the purchase requisition. So the purchase requisition is just that, a request. It is not an official document. In, so, so it is a paper document or electronic form that basically, as I said, says who's requesting the goods? Me. Where and when should they be delivered? Curse 354, which is my office. I want one 20-inch TV with a mounting frame, uh, and I don't know the price right offhand. And I'm going to try to get our department charged. Here's the, here's the thing that is control so that everybody can just send in purchase requisitions and get things is it needs to be approved by the department manager before it gets sent to the purchasing department. So somebody in my department would have to approve it and then it would get sent on. Now this approval could be electronic uh, as well as this purchase requisition. In the SUA project, it said basically a request was made verbally to Nancy that works in a company that's got three employees. It does not work in anything much larger than that. You want some paper trail. So then the purchasing department authorizes the purchase, yes. Notice when I talked about the purchase requisition, I did not say what vendor or supplier we were going to buy from. It is the purchasing department that th then selects the supplier and they look at th you know three different things, price, quality and dependability. So is this a reputable vendor? Now, the dependability of the goods is de determined upon the manufacturer, but if I'm looking for example for a TV, QB is it somebody who can deliver uh, on time and for a reasonable price. Now, notice that price is not the only thing because sometimes if you think about it, cheapest is not always cheapest. Now, purchasing also should be a tracking supplier performance. So do you have a supplier that is all of a sudden shipping late or giving us a lot of lower quality goods? We wanna be able to take care of that. So at this time, the purchasing agent then sends a purchase order to the supplier. So purchase order is the legal document. So this is an electronic or paper copy that tells the uh, request uh, a supplier to sell us some goods and deliver them. So it says, I want one 20 inch TV with mounting brackets. Uh, I want it by this date and I want it delivered. It's basically once it is accepted by the supplier, it is a contract. It is a promise to pay and a contract that the supplier will ship. If you look at all the legal ease that gets attached to every purchase order, it has got all types of exceptions and rules and things that will happen. For example, if the supplier can't meet the uh, request, uh, what happens when you pay late, etc. We're not going to go into all those details. We'll save that for uh, a supply chain type class. And then purchase, uh, there's also a blanket purchase order. So a lot of times you use these for services, but you can use it for anything that you buy a lot of. You will not use it for a one-time thing. So it's basically a commitment to purchase specified items from a particular supplier for a set period of time. Uh, one example is, as you know, I worked for John Deere, and if you can think about how a combine is made, it's got tons of nuts, bolts, washers, screws, all that little types of hardware. Well, rather than every time we wanted to buy a hundred or a thousand writing a new purchase order, we had a blanket purchase order that covered all the purchase we, purchases we thought we needed for three months or six months. Another logical area is to use it for services. So let's say I have a contractor to shovel my snow for my business. So they get their plow out or whatever equipment and clear my parking lot. I don't want to write a purchase order, have them accept it, then come over every time it snows. Uh, so I have a blanket purchase order that says, based on past experience, I average about $10,000. I'll write the purchase order for 10,000. 
they will take basically we will, I will pay every time they come out and it's deducted from the amount left on the purchase order. Now, when we get to that 10,000, we need to amend that purchase order or write a new one to increase the amount. So I think I mentioned most of these things that a purchase order has. Um, delivery location, shipping method. How is it going to get me? Is it shipped UPS, FedEx? Is it shipped through a, a larger carrier, et cetera? It just depends on what you are shipping. And here's your data flow diagram for uh, the purchase request. So we have a purchase requisition. So something triggers the purchase request uh, requisition and that goes to generate the purchase order, which goes finally to the vendor. All right, some things to look at for um, efficiency and effectiveness. So how can we make this more effective? First of all, get rid of paper documents and using EDI to transmit purchase orders. I believe in the last video we talked a little bit about uh, EDI, that it's not doesn't look like a document, like a PDF. It is a file of numbers and letters and characters all separated by commas, but it's in a very specific form that every system would read to, tr to translate it to a purchase order. So basically that electronic file gets sent to a central mailbox and then it gets sent to each individual vendor or customer depending on which direction you're going mailbox for them to import into their system the next one is vendor managed inventory system so um how does a vendor so basically a company says you know what i don't want to manage inventory for this part that we use all the time i'm going to give my supplier or vendor access to the system to know how many things I'm producing or how many things I'm selling, uh, what my forecast is, and you, the vendor, is responsible for making sure that there is enough inventory there at the right time. Um, in grocery stores, uh, soda pop or soda, uh, manu you know, Pepsi and Coke, actually do the managed inventory. They are responsible for refilling the shelves and having enough inventory there. Um, I believe like Frito-Lay does too as well. Then uh, the next way to improve effectiveness is reverse auctions. Uh, I'm not sure if, sure if you're aware of the show uh, Shipping Wars. I think it's off the air now. But basically that was an example of a reverse auction. Uh, vendors bid and they bid down instead of up to try to provide the lowest price. So in the show I mentioned, it was, if I wanted something unique shipped across the country, they did it for the show. Now the auction site works the same. I have something I wanna ship from here to uh, South Dakota. And I don't have the ability, it doesn't fit in my RAV4. So I call up somebody and say, here's the dimensions, the weight, um, what are you willing to, how much are you willing to receive to take this for me from Cedar Falls, Iowa to Rapid City, South Dakota? And they start the bidding. It might start out as 1000 and somebody else comes in at 900 and then 850 and it goes down. So then I can see what the lowest price potentially is. Now, I don't have to pick the lowest price. Maybe I look at the person's truck and it's you know, on their profile and it's all rusted, I could pick the next highest one, but it gives me a ballpark where the lowest price would be. And then pre-audit awards. So this is an audit before we award you the uh, purchase order. So may, this may be for a larger purchase or maybe something unique. We wanna make sure that you can make it and make good quality material before buying from you. It could also be an audit of financials. I want to make sure I want to buy this part for a long time. I want to make sure that um, you are financially solvent to be able to produce this for a long term. All right, so let's go into our threats and controls in this area. Um, inaccurate inventory records. We've already talked about this in Chapter 8. So I'm not going to repeat this. It's all the same things as we had before. 
Purchasing items not needed. So first of all, making sure our inventory records are up to date has a big part of that. So especially if you have uh, automatic triggers that say if our inventory records say we're down to 20, we should purchase. But if you actually have 30 in the bin, you're purchasing a little too early. You also want to review uh, purchase requisitions. So having somebody approve purchase requisitions uh, keeps the rogue employees like me from ordering stuff for her office that uh, is not needed. And then centralizing the purchase function. So they can get some volume discounts. Uh, they can make sure that we already don't have something on hand somewhere else potentially as well. And that we're only buying from good suppliers. So there's several reasons purchasing items not needed is just one of them. How do we make sure that we're purchasing at a good price? We don't want to pay too much, but we also want to need, we'll talk about quality here in a second. Remember, cheapest isn't always cheapest, uh, and I think we probably all have some personal experiences with that as well. So first of all, you want to have price list. Um, you know, most companies will have a general price list for what they sell. Now, you may be able to negotiate a lower price based on volume, for, for instance, the other thing for you, especially unique things or higher cost things, you want to get bids. So you say, I need this and give all of the specifications. Now, for some very specialized projects, uh, like a bigger uh, reconstruction or remodeling, you may have a very detailed list of what you want. And then um, vendors put in proposals and bids for what they think, what price they can think they can buy that for. Now you wanna make sure those bids are reviewed to make sure that they included everything that you asked for. And then you wanna review purchase orders. So uh, making sure that all the policies are, have been followed. We are buying from approved vendors that maybe we've already negotiated prices with, not going to somebody else and paying an extra amount. And then we'll use budgetary controls as well. So making sure that a department's not buying more than they need that you give them a budget and they need to stay within that budget. I kind of alluded to quality. We wanna make sure we buy good quality goods, you know, uh, the appropriate level of quality. We don't wanna buy things that are gonna break right away. So part of that is going from approved suppliers. Now, even if you have a approved supplier, it can change. Um, I know while I was working, uh, at Deer, you know, there were suppliers that were good quality and something changed that they were being evaluated. That happened fairly often. Um, so first of all, so then you re approve the purchases from new suppliers. So somebody's checked the quality of their goods, depending on what they're selling or, you know, that they're, they're fine. Also making sure that if you have a lot of rework and scrap, you work with your purchasing managers to make sure that that gets resolved. So as I said, that can change. You may have a lot of rework or scrap or warranty issues. Um, you wanna make sure if it's, you can pinpoint it to a particular supplier that you get that changed and work with that. Holding them, holding purchasing managers responsible means, you know, it's part of their performance appraisals, how they do those metrics, and they need to get those resolved for the following year. Unreliable, so besides quality, unreliable means maybe they're not shipping on time. Uh, we're really talking about delivery. So some things to look at, is the supplier certified? For example, an ISO 9000, and then also track, how many late shipments do they have? Is it just one day or are things shipping five, 10 days later than expected? So tracking that and looking for any patterns that recommend that you should change. And next, purchasing from unauthorized suppliers. So really, you should need to maintain a list of approved suppliers and only invoices from approved suppliers get approved. This does a couple things. First of all, somebody has to vet the supplier to put them on the list, meaning you need to first of all make sure they exist because that's a frequent fraud is making up getting a fake supplier on the list, or if you don't have a list, getting an invoice from a fake supplier and getting it paid. So making sure that we have only approved suppliers. 
Then you want to be able to configure the system to um, only let purchase orders be created that go to approved suppliers. All purchase. So then you, if you do have a new supplier, you want to only have a few purchases from them first before you do it permanently. And then um, for EDI, you want to look at controls of the purchase orders. So who has access? Uh, making sure that I can't change the EDI file after you know it's gone approval, and making sure that I don't add um, a purchase order to the EDI file that kind of bypasses all the processing. So kickbacks. So just a little general background on kickbacks. So if I'm a purchasing agent, I go work with uh, somebody in company A and the person in company A says, you know what? If you increase the volume of business that we're going to give, you know, that uh, your company's buying from us, I'll give you 5% of everything uh, you know, your company sell, buys. So, so company A is selling to company B. I work for company B. Company A says, I'm gonna charge company B a little bit more cash to buy my product. And if you can, you know, divert more sales there, I'm gonna give you 5% of everything company B buys. It'll write a check from company A to me. Once again, I work for company B. All right, so basically I'm getting kickback. And it's not always cash. Sometimes it's nice vacations, things like that, other gifts. So first of all, purchasing agents need to disclose any financial personal personal interest in suppliers. Maybe it's uh, more that my spouse owns the company and we're charging higher prices because I'm making the purchasing decisions. Purchasing agents should not accept gifts from any potential suppliers or existing suppliers. Um, I know for us that you could accept something, including dinner or lunch, up to $25. I think that's it is higher now. Last time I was working with suppliers, it was $25, which was a while ago. Uh, that included winning drawings. So if you want a drawing from one, you know, at a vendor show from one of your suppliers, you could not accept that. And I, that did happen in my case as well. Um, make sure your employees know how to respond. We've had to send things back uh, quite often just to keep within policy. And then rotating job duties and uh, vacation leave, that helps you so you don't become quite as uh, familiar with a particular supplier, not as close relationship, so you have to change once in a while. All right, so turn into your book once again in chapter nine, and chapter nine, and we are looking for problem one, which is, Oops, I'm in the wrong chapter on page. Sorry, I didn't have it marked ahead of time. Page 302. And look at problems A and K. We'll go over those answers um, in the next video.